Welcome to Hot Chips 23. Session 2. Security. I'll be your session chair. Uh, my name is Rumi, and uh, I'm very happy to uh, introduce our first speaker, which is uh, George Cox from uh, Intel. Uh, he's been at Intel for a grand total of uh, 36 years, and he's worked on everything from supercomputers to security circuits, and uh, that's what he's going to talk about today, uh, very specifically uh, the digital random number generator, uh, codenamed DRNG. George, please. Good morning. God, the microphone does work. Um, so, now for something entirely different. There's not any cores in here at all. I used to do parallel things. I remember them from doing supercomputing, but uh, this is not. So, I guess I'd better flick the slides. I should introduce uh, the two other people who are fundamental to the implementation of this, along with a bunch of people in various product groups. It's a fellow named Charles Dyke who invented the digital entropy source or digital true random number generator that we're gonna talk about. Now, Charles was born metastable and proves it every time I talk to him. Uh, DJ Johnston, uh, uh, who's the, the microarchitect of all the downstream post-processing logic, uh, it, it was, is also a major contributor here. I sort of lead the program uh, across Intel. Um, uh, there's a legal disclaimer, uh, which you will really want to put your mind to. Um, so, we're gonna, we, uh, we have an outline, and, and, and so we'll proceed down that outline. Um, in at least computing platforms that Intel makes, and I believe that others make too, there is there, and always has been a, what I'd call a platform entropy problem. There wasn't enough uh, digitized entropy available for doing all the things you'd like to, like making keys and, uh, and that sort of thing. Uh, and, and, it's, and it's caused a lot of uh, you know, things like software PRNGs and uh, entropy pools and all this kind of stuff to be built into various security libraries. We're trying to uh, deliver a, uh, uh, a mechanism that'll put uh, at rest the, many of those needs. We're gonna deliver consistently high quality, high performance, fully post-processed, that is not raw anymore. We're gonna deliver you cooked entropy on each Intel Silicon product. And of course, I'm not allowed to say when and where and why, but soon. Go to IDF and you'll see uh, presentations on the first such vehicle. The goal is basically if, if entropy is needed on a piece of Intel Silicon, this device will be there uh, ubiquitously. In fact, when we first started this program, there were a half a dozen different um, uh, analog ring oscillator based uh, uh, TRNGs on Intel Silicon, none of them related to anything else. And since only one of the six was mine, the other five were, of course, not optimal. And uh, it's been my goal to kill all six. I'm down to one left, and uh, when it moves from 32 to 22 nanometer, it will be in, uh, of this sort. So, uh, and you'd think that getting a small little company like Intel to do the same thing everywhere consistently would be a fun uh, opportunity. We can talk about that a little later. Um, it's, we're, we're building it to be reusable across the process, design, and manufacturing environments. Those are three different uh, rocks in your road. Uh, the process rock, the manufacturing rock, and, and the design rock. Because, of course, we use the same tools uh, and manufacturing processes for all of our products. Mm -hmm. So, we're going to embed it everywhere, and it'll be all, it will be good. So, what is it that we're talking about building? We're talking about building a reusable block and it has all this stuff in it. Uh, what we'll really talk about is, well, how does this little sweetheart work? Uh, am, I, am I pointing anywhere useful? 
This is a pipeline. Of course, I have a tr tremor, so you'll have to watch where I'm sort of pointing. Um, there's something called an entropy source, which is, uh, we'll talk about it in detail later, but basically it's a, uh, it's a noise sensor. Uh, it's a digital noise sensor. It senses uh, thermal noise and uh, captures and digitizes it. Uh, because it is a digital circuit, we're actually have, able to have a mathematical model for it, which is not true of uh, analog entropy sources. Because we're able to have that, we, have, uh, we know uh, uh, expected arrival rates of certain short patterns under a curve that tell us an indirect measure of the quality of the entropy. That is, they tell us the measure of how well the entropy source is working relative to its mathematical model. Uh, that's carried out by our online health tests. Um, uh, based on the output of the online health test, we know how much of that uh, raw entropy that's coming out of the entropy source we should accumulate before we uh, use what's called a conditioner on it. A conditioner is basically an entropy extraction uh, or an entropy um, factoring tool. Um, and then uh, we use the, the outputs of that conditioner to seed a deterministic random bit generator or a hardware PRNG, if you want to call it that. And uh, that uh, then does all the smoothing, spreading, and whitening that uh, you would expect uh, from a DRBG. So those are, that's a three-stage, well, three or four-stage pipeline, depending on how you count it. This is all an autonomous unit. You can't tell it to do anything from the outside other than would you give me some entropy. Uh, it, we know better than you know, because, and we have more entropy inside than you have outside anyway, so we don't let you give us any, and we don't let you tell us when to do reseeding. And we don't let you tell us anything because we know better. And so there. Uh, I'm being a little facetious. Um, we have mechanisms. We have a, a built-in self-test. It gives us about 98% coverage on all our logic. Uh, it's one of the things you learn when you, you, when you walk up to your design for test engineering staff and say, I have a de non-deterministic circuit here. What do you think? You're gonna, you like it, right? I want to build an instruction that gives you non-deterministic results. And you know, there's a lot of this going on. And, and they say, well, how are we gonna test that? And then you tell them, well, I have a built-in self-test. And they, you know, once you get through and it says, well, there's only two bits you have to test to see pass fail at high volume manufacturing. And they're, once they believe that it has coverage, they go, oh, good. And then they leave you alone, more or less. Uh, but just in case it didn't work, it turns out there's a test port mechanism in the side that you can use to, uh, when you're in the right mode, uh, look at all its internals and uh, and we, we built that because those DFX people didn't believe that we could ever build anything that would work and so that they would have to go and look inside. It turns out that the test port was used deeply in, uh, in debugging the thing, but in product, uh, have not used it yet. So it's like it's, it, 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 had a, it had a better use than what we wanted for it. It turns out that uh, bolting a, uh, anything like this into a platform, you have to have a... Uh, we have a wrapper that bolts up to whatever the local buses and the platform are. And, you know, wouldn't you like to think that in a nice, well-managed company like Intel, we'd have all the same local buses across all our platforms? Hmm. Eh, not so lucky. In fact, over the five embeddings we've completed so far, uh, about 40% of the work has been in the wrapper rather than the, the DRNG itself. Uh, and that's, uh, that's an indictment of one sort or another. Um, the DRBG, is designed to be NIST SP800-90 compliant. That is, the quality we guarantee is based on the standard we're compliant to, and it's designed to be uh, FIPS uh, certifiable, uh, which is uh, as yet not quite done. Uh, and, and I think we've talked about the rest of it. Uh, oh, the red dotted line is the FIPS boundary. This is the first that we know of, the first that I know of, uh, white box in black box uh, certification for FIPS. We're telling uh, the FIPS lab that we're working with everything about the inside of that red box and how it keeps people from getting inside of it when it's in FIPS mode. And we're not telling them anything at all about the billions and billions of transistors around it on the same die, because this is embedded in the middle of a processor die or a chipset die. And this black, white box and black box uh, FIPSing is a uh, relatively new, if not to brand new, uh, a certification um, a model that we're working on. And um, let's see where we go from here. Yes, I know it's, okay. So as I said, we're at, this is a multi-stage pipeline. 
uh, queues between them, uh, autonomously uh, scheduled, so there's no external inputs at all. You can't tell it to do anything except give me some entropy. Um, and it's, uh, and um, it, 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 uh, the entropy starts on the left, goes through the various processing, uh, creates on the right. When the queues are full on the right, then they back up all the way to the left. And what are you supposed to do when you're not doing anything useful? Well, you're supposed to either clock gate yourself or power gate yourself, and we do that autonomously. So uh, that's all the power story for this poor little thing, and it doesn't burn much power anyway. Um, oh, and because everything's autonomous, when we decide we've conditioned something really nice, uh, we go ahead and reseed the DRBG, uh, which is a good thing. You know, you can, with this particular standard of DRBGs, you don't have to reseed, but every two to the 41th generates or something like that. Uh, the worst case under max load that we can put on it in a, as yet unannounced to silicon product, it will reseed every 25 generates. So uh, the whole idea of being able to look at the output of a DRBG or a PRNG and uh, compute what the keys were inside of it is uh, uh, made relatively impractical uh, by, by our. The thing you gotta understand, we'll get to it in a minute, but this entry source is not like what you think of when you think of an analog TRNG with, that might produce a few hundred kilobits a second of sampling. Uh, this poor little sucker makes up its mind and gives us a bit between two and a half and three and a half gigatimes a second. So it's a, this, from a paucity of entropy in the platform, you now turn to an abundance of entropy in the platform. Um, okay, let's see, next slide. Well, an entropy source. Uh, all it is, really, is in this case, it's a differential latch right here in the second box up. And uh, we push it into metastability. Uh, thermal noise drives it out of metastability uh, through a clock and data reduction mechanism. Uh, since we're making entropy or capturing and digitizing entropy so fast, uh, the downstream logic, uh, the conditioners and all that stuff, really only runs at maybe a third of the rate that the entropy source does. The entropy source is an asynchronous self-time circuit. And so we end up, instead of throwing away some of those bits, because we make two or three or four bits for every one bit we take out of it, uh, we end up using an XOR circuitry, an XOR accumulated circuitry, which actually, since XOR is the entropy preserving it, 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 uh, it, it actually improves the, the entropy as you're going. And then we have synchronizers at the boundary where we go across into the, into the, the rest of the downstream logic. Uh, it turns out that to keep an entropy source centered on its curve, that we talked about the mathematical model that we need for it, uh, we, have a, uh, we have a feedback circuit that, uh, depending on the arrival rates of certain bits and so forth, it drives the uh, center of the, uh, it, it drives the, some bias on the, uh, on the devices in that differential latch uh, to keep the, the circuit centered, both uh, for, uh, but mostly for if there were any manufacturing anomalies, since this is a differential latch, you could have manufacturing anomalies just across that uh, differential latch. And so we have this compensating circuit that deals with those kinds of issues. Um, we could, that's another longer term topic. Uh, this makes cross-process migration easier because this is, this, is large, this is basically a digital circuit. Requires a small amount of hand layout uh, for each process, but all for all products on a process, it's the same. DRBG, as we said, uh, it's, a, it's got two pipeline stages in it. They use, it uses an encrypt only, very small AES unit, and it, and it does both uh, Entropy extraction via AES CBC MAC construct, and then using the same AES unit in counter mode with a different scheduling, it, it gives us uh, NIST SP 800 90 uh, outputs. Okay. Um, moving through this quickly. Performance. Well, it does. It does perform. Um, the entropy source self time produces, as I said, between two and a half and three and a half gigabits a second. That's in you know semiconductor processes have a, a PVT box that you work in. In the slow, slow, slow corner, uh, uh, you'll, uh, on a, say, a 22 nanometer process like this is talking about, it'll still be producing well above a gigabit a second. So uh, all of, this is all designed so that at every stage it, uh, it's over-designed by about a factor of 50%. Uh, it turns out, I didn't talk about quality, Turns out that, that in terms of measured quality out of the entropy source, you know, because it's raw, 
uh, had been post-processed, you might expect bias and correlation issues like that. Uh, turns out that uh, we designed it so that it didn't have to be more than deliver more than 0.5 bit per bit entropy. The lowest we've measured uh, is somewhere around 0.92 bits per bit entropy out of it. In fact, we had, uh, as you probably know, the tests you use on PRNGs or DRBGs are pass-fail tests, and they and they they uh, they expect perfect uh, uh, entropy. It turned out that we have one stream, uh, 100, about 100 megabytes out of out of one particular entropy source, that we had to run more than 80 megabytes of that through something like Die Hard uh, to get it to get the test to even be able to tell that the raw entropy wasn't uh, a, a, a one bit per bit. So. It's, uh, it does a pretty fair job, and, and, it, and it slings bits at you pretty fast. We, as we said, we accumulate them. We measure the quality of the s s small bit strings coming out against the expected mathematical model for the uh, entropy source, and judge whether the, the entropy source, how healthy it is at any point in time, uh, and compensate, use that to compensate uh, if we ever need to, in terms of how much entropy we pass through uh, this uh, CBC MAC construct. Basically, we take 512 bits in there. Uh, we uh, condition them down to uh, 256 bits of one bit per bit entropy. And then we use that 256 bits to seed this 128 bit DRBG. So there's two factors of uh, uh, two uh, compression in what we're, we're using here. The, uh, the, the DRBG itself takes 11 clocks to generate 128 bits at, uh, at, uh, uh, at 800 megahertz. In effect, it's a, it, uh, at 800 megahertz, it's generating 800 megabytes a second of uh, post-processed entropy uh, that we can deliver through what will show up here in a, in a minute as an instruction. Um, it turns out that uh, um, that, that 800 megabytes a second, uh, then you have to deliver that across chip to the uh, processor cores or whoever, whatever other agent on the die might be using it. Okay. Okay. Oh, and as I said for DFX, um, in order to, we went into this a bit naive in terms of, um, I, I hadn't done a random number generator since 98 or 99 when I did the one that was in our chipsets, and I'd forgotten how picky these, uh, DFX people are. But um, we, uh, we, we built a comprehensive BIST, and again, it says a pass-fail indication. And once they believe the test worked, which was the really the hard part, then they're tickle pink that all they got to do in manufacturing is just test two bits, and they're done. Uh, the online health tests that we, I talked about, because they, they help it see if it, the entropy source is matching its model, um, we test every single bit that comes out of there of the entropy source all the time, dynamically, okay? Um, the test port, well, it's, it's, been, uh, it's been used, it turned out for things we didn't think we were, you know, we thought, well, we're writing this logic and it's not that much of it, it'll be fine. Well, it turns out like all other logic, it wasn't. Uh, but it is now, and uh, that's, that's a good thing. Um, th we did this because uh, the test port was put in we don't scan, we don't, you can't have scan running through a FIP certified element. And so we couldn't let it be scanned. And of course that was another little bit of an argument with our DFX people. What do you mean I can't see your bits when everything else is going on? So one thing we did have to do for them though, um, non-deterministic outputs from a random number generator when you're running a big bunch of software with multiple threads and they're all going after random numbers uh, at, at arbitrary times, they don't want to have the wrong, rent. They, they want determinism. So we have a deterministic mode that you might like. You all may have seen a, uh, a Dilbert cartoon a while back. It was about randomness. And uh, they, uh, in, the, in the cartoon, there with the, 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 you know, Dilbert's taking his manager down to look at this new random number generator. And the, on the screen, it's coming out 9999999999999. And the manager said, is, is that random? And of course, the Dilbert said, well, you know, that's the hard thing to know with random number generators. Well, but you see, there, there was something to be learned there. If you really want, not, if you really want uh, deterministic outputs, we have a Dilbert mode uh, uh, so, that, uh, so that parallel applications running in real systems 
that don't want to have to deal with uh, non-determinism don't. Uh, so uh, Dilbert, was, Dilbert was helpful in this regard. Um, let's see. Uh, software interface. Well, um, this is, we're bringing this to you as, a, as, a, as, a, as an instruction. We don't believe that anyone should get between you and your entropy. You don't need no stinking operating system. You don't need no stinking library. You don't need no stinking software post-processing. We just give it to you directly in your registers. So you say read random, and we give you uh, the entropy you want. And that does have some performance advantages of uh, you know, avoiding calling down through a stack and coming back up to a stack and all of that sort of thing. You can still do that if you want, but you know. Uh, we have, uh, the, the, it's public, uh, the instruction has been public for over a year. People have been guessing about what the heck it did underneath. Well, now we're telling you. And there's a software implementation guide that tells how to use it, tells how to use it uh, directly, tells how to use it through libraries, tells how to use it, uh, the outputs to seed software PRNGs if you insist, that sort of thing. Um, the main point is it's available to any system or application software running on the platform. No hardware's ring requirements, restrictions of any kind. You go, uh, you just get it. Another thing is uh, uh, you don't need to virtualize it because it's like add and subtract. It just works. So, uh, so hypervisors don't need to get in the way. Operating systems don't need to get in the way. They may choose to, but they don't need to. Um, that's, uh, and let's see. Um, this is, um, well, I'm not going to do too much on this. It turns out if you got really lethargic entropy production, you end up having to accumulate it because it's a scarce resource. You end up having to put it in a pool. Uh, and then you have to use it slowly to, uh, to uh, reseed a software PRNG. We've, we're basically turning that on its head. Uh, instead of uh, entropy being a, a scarce or rare resource, it's, it's a fire hose coming at you. Uh, the post-processing has already been done. You don't need to do any more. You can if you want, but you don't need to do any more. And so all the old entropy pool stuff that's in a lot of software systems like in Linux and other people's RNG mechanisms eventually has no reason to remain. It will remain for a generation or so. They'll take our entropy and uh, use it to seed their software PRNGs and that's uh, fine. It's better than what they had before by gobs, but uh, eventually we would hope that they, you can move, uh, remove a lot of that complexity and attackability in software systems uh, by direct use. Okay, so in terms of solving the platform entry problem, in the past, you know, you've had things like mouse and keyboard timings, uh, uh, disk response timings, etc., as as sources of entropy. Uh, one of the problems you find is in virtualized Servers, especially that have SSDs, they ain't no keyboard, they ain't no mouse, they ain't no rotating mass store. All of those sources of potentially capturable entropy, not there anymore. And in fact, in, in, in the server marketplace, this, new f this feature becomes more interesting because it, 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 it solves a problem that, they were, that was getting worse over time. Okay. And uh, so instead of doing a, you know, the hypervisor can use it directly, the, the VTOS can use it directly, or applications can use it directly, and it's, it's all available to all of them at all the time, okay? Um, I guess that was that. And I didn't throw off the end. Any questions? Israel Cohen from the University of Massachusetts. Did you measure the quality of your random number generation as a function of the operating temperature? What happens if you lower the temperature of the circuit almost to freezing? Do you yeah. get 9999? <laughs> well, you get a lot of different effects uh, that we could talk about outside, but uh, in, Intel and every other semiconductor manufacturer makes products that work in a certain PVT box, you know. And uh, then you simulate uh, and, 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 and measure outside that box to, uh, for some percentage. We do all that and it works fine inside that box at low, low to high temperatures, low to high voltages, et cetera. And we do, at least early on, 
we're being a bit careful that we're measuring and, and, and evaluating long streams, offline long streams of both raw and cooked entropy to make sure that they are of the quality that we expect. Uh, part of the, the, the measurement of that has to do with the FIP certification, but yes. So um, the only time we've had this entropy source not uh, have some anomalies was if, it, if we ever run it below about 16 megahertz on a 22 nanometer process. And of course, you know, you'd have to be constraining it in some very hard ways to make it run that slow. Yes. Hi, uh, John Montrum, NVIDIA. Are there um, power states in which the circuit is shut off completely? And if so, are there any considerations about wake up time when it comes back on? That's a very good question. Um, when we were clock gating it, the entropy source was kept just ticking away because of the downstream logic as the dominant uh, active uh, power consumer. Uh, when we go to, uh, and, and when we have now to uh, fully uh, power gated, uh, there was always the anxiety that uh, there, there would be some issue. It turns out that full power gating is effectively equivalent to a reset. And this thing goes through its, uh, built-in self-test uh, of the entropy source and the downstream logic at that point. So it, uh, we test it to make sure it's running well. So uh, there was the anxiety that it, that it wouldn't be. We haven't had any failures of that sort yet. That's all I can say. D okay. Does that mean that if an instruction goes to get a random number that the built-in self-test on, on wake up may not be ready to give it a number or do we simply not restart the processor until the random uh, source is ready. There's some interesting timing questions there, but uh, at this point, uh, by the time software is running, it will have entropy available. Okay, That's a good, good question to both of them. Any more? Well, um, then all I can say is uh, thank you very much. Uh, there'll, be, uh, there'll be a quiz. No, I'm sorry. Uh, let's see. <laughs> there will be announcements at IDF in September about the uh, arrival of uh, products across the spectrum that uh, will contain this feature. Okay, uh, thank you very much, George. Let's have a hand. Okay, uh, next up we have, uh, let's make sure we get the right one. Next up we have Carl uh, Ramy from uh, Tylera. And uh, let me just pull his thing up here, oops. Let's drive this properly here. This mouse is uh, I think I need help. Whose laptop is this? I'm just having a little trouble driving. Oh, there we go. We're getting it back. Just leave, leave alone. Oh, okay. Thank you. Okay, so. Uh, uh, Carl is uh, the lead uh, I.O. architect at uh, Tylera. Uh, prior to uh, being at Tylera, he was uh, on design validation for the 21, 264, 364, and 464 Alpha processors at uh, Digital Equipment Corporation. Uh, he subsequently designed uh, PCI Express and Switch Fabric uh, ASICs at Stargen, and uh, Carl holds a bachelor and master's degree in electrical engineering from Carnegie Mellon University. So welcome, uh, Carl, go ahead. Thank you. <clears throat> so today I'm going to be talking about the Tile GX100 many core processor. Um, specifically, I'm going to be talking about acceleration, interfaces, uh, and architecture. And actually, I think I'm in the wrong line of work because when my circuits have entropy, my boss uh, yells at me. Um, so um, I'm going to have to give you a little bit of an overview of how our processor uh, works, our cache coherence architecture, and how we deliver I.O. data into the chip. Uh, but then I'd like to get into our on-chip uh, accelerator, specifically the things we use for doing packet processing uh, and crypto and compression operations. So the GX100 uh, is a 100-core processor. It's got 64-bit uh, cores. Um, they run over gigahertz. We have 32 megabytes of on-chip cache distributed throughout the, the chip. And the, uh, our cores are called tiles, and they're interconnected um, with a number of mesh networks that provide uh, up to 200 terabits per second of on-chip bandwidth. 
This is all fed from DDR3 controllers. Uh, we have four of those, which provide uh, almost 500 gigabits per second of DDR3 bandwidth. And since we're talking about I.O. today the, um, as our focus, uh, the I.O. interfaces, we have 100 gigabits per second of packet I.O., and we achieve that through a combination of interlock and ports, Zowie ports, uh, gigabit Ethernet ports. Um, we also have PCI Express interfaces, which we're not going to talk about today. And M-Pipe is our on-chip NIC. So this is our wire speed packet engine that's delivering 120 million packets per second uh, to the applications that are running on the chip. For acceleration, we support up to 40 gigabits of crypto. Um, that's small packet performance. Large packet performance would typically be higher than that. And that's for things like AES, IPsec, et cetera. We also have compression engines, which are becoming more and more important uh, in applications. So just, a, again, a little background on the actual uh, architecture of the core. It's a globally shared physical address space, fully cache coherent. We have a terabyte of addressable space, so that's uh, 40 bits of physical address space. Complete hardware cache coherent, so we run SMP uh, Linux across all 100 cores. It's a standard shared memory programming model, so you don't have to go modify your source code to, to work with our chip. Uh, I.O. read and write data is actually participating in the cache coherence protocol. So when an I.O. read comes in, uh, we deliver that directly into the, the core, and the data is delivered out to the I.O. device, uh, similarly with writes. Um, we also provide, we're going to talk a lot about today about virtualization uh, and user I.O. I think virtualization is kind of a, a buzzword and gets overused, but um, specifically when I talk about virtualization, I'm referring to the ability to take hardware resources and partition those up and deliver those directly to the user. So this is, uh, might be what you call hardware-assisted virtualization. So once we've uh, partitioned resources and given those off to the user, uh, it's a direct interaction between the user and the I.O. device or the accelerator. He doesn't have to go through a hypervisor or any other um, system calls in order to talk to his hardware. But at the same time, it's fully protect protected uh, through a standard uh, virtual address translation mechanism. Um, we provide these on-chip accelerators for doing things like crypto and compression. So what we found is as we're building more and more cores, um, there, are certain, uh, there are certain tasks such, such as crypto, AES, et cetera, that don't really make sense to implement in a standard general purpose core. You end up burning all of your compute power just doing the crypto portion of your application. Um, and really, um, you know, 90% of your application is the stuff beyond that. We want to get into layer three, layer four processing. Uh, the packet data. So we provide some on-chip accelerators to sort of perform in an energy-efficient way those operations that just wouldn't work well uh, in the general purpose core. I'm not really going to be talking any more about the, the core itself, so now we're going to talk about the I.O. processor, our I.O. Uh, network interface. So M-Pipe is our multi-core programmable packet engine. Uh, fundamentally, its, its goal is to deliver wire speed performance. So on this particular device, that's 120 million packets per second. Um, delivered into the worker tiles. Um, but at the same time, we need it to be programmable. So we're trying to build systems that will work well in a cloud computing environment where you may have different requirements than, say, uh, a networking app at the, edge of the, um, at the edge of the network where I might have more crypto heavy, uh, more compression. So we can, we can sort of balance that and achieve a programmable um, network interface that works well across multiple applications and still maintains that wire speed performance and energy uh, efficiency. Packet data, again, is fed directly to the user, so you don't need to do a system call to grab, your, to grab your packet, and when you want to send a packet, you don't have to go up through the operating system. Packet, uh, M-Pipe itself is broken into these uh, three major chunks, the packet parsing classification. This is our, uh, separate from our main 100 cores, they're, they're cores that live out inside the M-Pipe engine. These are small uh, cores dedicated just for doing packet classification and parsing, and we, got a couple, we have a couple slides on that in a few minutes. Um, and so really the classifier's job is to parse the headers, uh, de-encapsulate, <coughs> excuse me, de-encapsulate the packet and figure out what application the packet belongs to. Load balancing is actually the next major piece. Um, we're finding it in many cores as we go from 2 to 4 to 32 to 100 cores, the load balancer becomes more and more, and more important. Uh, any single core can't necessarily do the line rate. So, um, you know, 120 million packets per second through a single core just isn't practical. So the, the flows need to be distributed across the chip. And so I think uh, go, in the future, you're going to see things like load balancers becoming more and more important uh, in multi-core and many-core designs. The load balancer um, provides direct-to-tile distribution. Um, it's all cache coherent. So again, uh, 
because the I.O. is participating in the cache coherence protocol, it becomes seamless for the user to uh, send and receive packets. We also do things like buffer management uh, in hardware. So you could consider this sort of an acceleration feature in, in the sense that if you try to do this in software, you only have a few handful of nanoseconds to deliver each buffer. So by implementing it in hardware, uh, we can provide buffers to the user or to uh, the M-pipe engine at line rate. We also provide egress services for doing um, reordering and synchronization so that you can distribute your packets out across many cores, um, operate on the packets, and then put the flow back together before you ship it out. So ordering is another big consideration uh, in packet processing on a, on a many core design. So we, again, throughout the stack, we're supporting round robin distribution, load leveling, all through um, one cache coherent interface. And virtualization shows up on every slide, so I probably don't need to talk about it on every slide. Um, so MPipe, the soft, software interface is pretty simple. Um, the user application, when he wants to set up a connection, maybe he wants an Ethernet port, maybe he wants uh, a queue or a VLAN within that port, goes through the operating system um, and optionally a hypervisor to do the setup. And the setup's all done through memory mapped I.O. We have a um, special page table entry that maps you out to the I.O. that you want to talk to. Once that's installed, uh, the hypervisor sets up all the hardware resources and allocates it to your application. Once everything's been set up, though, uh, the communication is direct. So you're, you're sending your packets directly to MPipe, you're receiving your packets directly from MPipe, and then the accelerators, which we're going to talk about in the, in the second half, um, are all directly accessible through that, through that same um, interface through virtual address space. Uh, everything's moved cache coherently, including the interrupts. So the interrupts are delivered uh, coherently to the tile, um, directly into user space. So when you receive an interrupt, say, on a high priority packet delivery um, or even an exception condition, that can be delivered directly in, into user space. We can also deliver that interrupt uh, up to the operating system or hypervisor, but you don't have to do that. So you don't have to be proxying and up calling, down calling, moving your interrupts around between uh, protection levels. We also support uh, a single descriptor format throughout the whole chip. So for example, when we deliver a packet into the user's uh, virtual address space, and let's say he decides that he wants to perform a max sec operation on it um, or some other kind of crypto op, he can send that out to one of the accelerators. The operation um, acts on that, and it's all through virtual address pointers. It's essentially a zero copy system, uh, even though we're moving data all around the chip. The user doesn't have to worry about pushing, putting in a different buffer, reformat reformatting descriptors. It's all pretty seamless. Virtualization, again, is all through the TLB, so it's a standard protection model uh, that we've sort of extended into the I.O. devices, and we're going to talk a little about that uh, in one of the future slides here. The packet flow itself it consists of packets arriving from, from Max, whether that's interlocking or Zowie ports. Those get dropped into a large packet buffer, and the packet buffer's job is really there just to cover the bandwidth delay product while we're doing classification, load balancing, uh, figure out where we're going to send this thing. So as the packet's accumulating, we send the headers over to our classification engine, and we're going to talk about that in the next slide. But the, the classification engine, his job is really just to do the stateless portion of the L2 through L4 parsing. He's not doing session state lookup, but he's, say, he's more identifying, all right, this is an IPv4, this matches a VLAN that, that I expected, whatever it might be. So he parses the headers and selects the flow. Um, or more precisely, I think, is really select the application. Is this going, we might be running a firewall on a, on a dozen tiles while we're running snort on another you know, 25 tiles. So uh, the classifier's job is to figure out you know, what group of tiles is getting this thing. Uh, at the same time, he's going to assign a buffer pool. So he can do size-based buffer distribution um, or just decide, um, you know, use this buffer pool for this application, another bu buffer pool for another application, again, maintaining that resource partitioning that's been set up by the operating system. Uh, after the packet's been delivered to the load balancer, he's going to choose the, the correct worker within the group of tiles. So that might be as simple as round robin. Uh, more likely, it's a, some sort of load leveled distribution of the flow, such that you try to deliver it to the least busy queue. And uh, we tend to try to affinitize flows so that you deliver um, the same flow to the same worker uh, to give you some more temporal locality of all your session state data. Uh, and then after we've picked a worker, we DMA the data, write that into the distributed cache. Um, and then we write a descriptor. So the descriptor is a 64-byte structure that's been generated by our programmable classifier. That structure uh, is written into a ring buffer, into the, typically into the, work, into the worker's cache. So the worker is just sitting there polling, waiting for a packet to show up. Um, or you can get an interrupt. So you can, um, you can be servicing maybe hundreds of queues on a single worker and get an interrupt when something arrives for your queue. And then we can bounce between those models. And that's sort of the Linux uh, nappy style interrupt delivery model where on the first packet arrival, you take the interrupt, 
uh, service the queue, uh, keep polling until it's empty, and then go back into an interrupt mode with some amount of hysteresis. So this lets you, again, service multiple queues, uh, service a mixture of high priority, low priority queues, all while maintaining uh, quality of service guarantees. The classifier itself, uh, I always say it's C programmable. And by that, I mean it, it's, uh, we have a compiler. You just write standard C code for it. It's not some crazy micro sequencer where you have to learn a special language to control the thing. Um, you know, with a bunch of cams and everything you have to line up. It's just a, basically a, a small general purpose processor with a, with a few caveats that I'll talk about in the next slide. And his job is to spit out this 64-byte descriptor. Um, about half of that descriptor is stuff that's needed by the hardware, like which buffer pool am I going to use, uh, what application is going to receive this packet, am I doing an IP checksum on the packet. Um, but then another about 30-some you know, bytes of the descriptor are, can be there just for user data. So uh, people often use that to generate the offset within the packet that they want to use once they start parsing. Um, so after we get through the classifier, um, basically the, the classifier, it, because it's doing stateless processing, um, we can feed a single stream of packets out to um, n processors and then stitch them back together in, any, in, uh, in order, and we can process the, the headers in any order we want because it's stateless. So it gives us perfect linear scaling. As we add classifiers, uh, we add classification performance, and this lets us build as much overhead into the system as we want. So software really sees it as a single high-speed processor instead of a bunch of little engines. The classifier itself, um, it has a few special features. It's optimized for doing parsing. It's 16 bits, which aligns well with uh, packet processing. It's a single issue in order, uh, three-stage pipe. A couple of special ops for doing checksums, uh, you know, the ones complement checksums for Ethernet, uh, and some hashing operations that are used for generating flow IDs. Um, the hashing that we do supports a symmetric hash so that we can have guarantee that a flow going in one direction, say the source IP and source port going to a dest IP and dest port, can be hashed going the other direction to map into the same bucket uh, if you want. But it's fully programmable, so you can pick how you want to do your delivery. Um, one of the main features that differentiates this from a general purpose processor is the way we do our operand sources and de destinations. So we can feed any byte from the header directly into the ALU, and we can feed any byte from uh, the ALU directly into the descriptor. And so if you look at doing packet processing on a general purpose core, if you were going to look at a 128-byte header or a 64-byte header or whatever it is, you'd have to do a load instruction for every two bytes, and you'd have to do a store instruction for, um, for every set of bytes that you wanted to write to a descriptor. So we save that you know, 50, 100 instructions um, by, do it, by allowing direct access. And so this really increases our headroom uh, and increases the performance. It's also dynamically reconfigurable. So if you want to update your VLAN tables on the fly, change the MAC addresses, uh, register new flows, take applications down, bring new applications up, that can all be changed on the fly uh, at line rate without dropping any packets. Uh, the performance itself, again, exceeds 120 million packets per second. And that's using a, what we call full featured classification program. So that includes IPv4, IPv6, some layers of encapsulation, unrolling. Um, and doing header validation. And that actually was with about 200 or slightly less than 200 cycles out of the 260 cycle packet budget. So that actually leaves a fair bit of headroom for doing customization. Uh, in the past, we've seen with a lot of network processors where if you want to change the program or change what you're doing, you have to give something up. You have to get rid of a feature because everything ends up so tightly packed that you don't have the ability to customize without, without losing capability. It becomes a multi-month uh, process just to do, do something different with the VLAN or something. So we actually provide a fair bit of headroom in this design uh, to make it easy to keep up with line rate. So we talked about how the packets actually get delivered uh, into the core, and now we want to perform some sort of acceleration option like crypto. Um, so when we started looking at doing uh, on-chip acceleration, um, we had two choices. Well, actually, three. You know, one choice is don't do any uh, acceleration at all and just do it in general purpose computes. Um, we talked about that earlier. It just sort of doesn't fit well for energy efficiency. If you burn up a whole chip's worth of area just doing your crypto, then you don't have anything left over to do, to do the you know, sort of real compute. So when we looked at doing some hardware-assisted acceleration, um, we saw two major ways to do this, what we would call uh, off-core acceleration, and that's a centralized accelerator that would live um, out of the core. Uh, and in that model, you have a single shared resource, which tends to be um, intuitively sort of the enemy of multi-core, many-core. Trying to have a, a single shared resource and many cores, it doesn't seem to scale. It doesn't allow you, uh, you end up having to lock, uh, and locks are pretty terrible uh, in many-core. And so just sort of generally not palatable for the, for the design. And it has a queuing issue. So if I have a single shared resource that's doing my crypto operation uh, and it's working on a large packet, but then a small packet from a high priority queue shows up, um, 
I get variable latency and high latency. It's not really good for real-time systems. So you know, there's these basic problems with doing some kind of a shared accelerator or off-core off, um, off acceleration. The other model is in-core acceleration, which at first seems a pretty good fit for, for multi-core. As you add cores, uh, you add more capability. So on a larger chip, you get more capability. And in, in the in-core acceleration, you put a small amount of uh, accelerator into each core, so maybe a small amount of AES or whatever operation you want to achieve. The problem with this is trying to get high bandwidth, uh, or high performance um, on, on uh, high bandwidth flow. So for example, if I have a 10 gigabit or a 40 gigabit system, I'm delivering that packet data into a small handful number of cores um, that are doing my, so supposed to be doing my crypto front end. Each one of those cores can't necessarily keep up with the line rate. So what I have to do then is distribute my packets across more cores than I really wanted to. Um, the other way to look at that is you get a poor kind of balance of temporal or spatial localization of that uh, acceleration feature. So in other words, if 90% of my application isn't doing crypto, um, which is what we're sort of aiming for, then that means that 90% of my cores uh, at any one time or, or in space, spatially, are, are wasting those transistors. Those transistors are sitting there leaking uh, and not earning their keep. So we really, uh, we want things to scale, but at the same time, it's impossible to build. Um, you really don't want to optimize that smaller piece of your application and then take the hit on every core. Uh, the model we see that make, we think makes more sense uh, is to add the appropriate amount of acceleration and then scale the cores. So you, you scale the general purpose stuff, but don't scale uh, the, spe the, the uh, special purpose stuff. Um, and the other problem with the in-core acceleration that we found was that and sometimes, you know, uh, earlier in Rick's talk, he talked about scaling down for multi-cores just as important. And we're seeing the same thing. That we want to build big chips and small chips. And when we build a small chip, um, we might want a lot of crypto performance on a small chip because it might be a, a network front end. It might be sitting at the edge, might be terminating uh, SSL, whatever it is. So we want to be able to scale down but maintain a different level of compute. So we're scaling the, the compute and the acceleration capability differently. Um, so for all those reasons, we really wanted to go with uh, an off-core acceleration model. So how do we solve some of the problems with the off-core, the locking uh, and the shared resources? So what we did is we added essentially multi-client support, or you can call that virtualization. Um, but essentially, what, uh, the term we use is context. We add a number of contexts to our accelerator. Each context can then be mapped uh, directly to the user. So the user's perspective is that he has one big honking fast crypto engine. Uh, when in reality there's a lot of different uh, resources or a lot of different tiles that are all sharing that resource. And then we can allocate that uh, at setup time to give him the appropriate amount of bandwidth that, that he needs. So this gives us the capability of having very high performance on single streams, and then it also lets us scale uh, across systems, across different platforms. And then th this is sort of where the uh, heterogeneous meets the homogeneous. The homogeneous fabric can talk to these heterogeneous uh, encryption, decryption engines. Um, so we can add different amount of encryption capability, compression, decompression. Um, another engine we actually have on chip is a mem copy, so we can do a high performance cache to cache copy without you having to do a bunch of loads and stores uh, in the core. And so the nice thing here again is we get a single architecture across multiple design points. So the software guys like this because then they can run their same binaries. Uh, it's an API to talk to the accelerators, but we're not changing the instruction set. We're not changing sort of the in-core stuff uh, with each generation or with e within uh, each device within a product generation, well, product family, excuse me. The, uh, the context themselves are really just a set of service request parameters. By that I mean you basically set up what it is you want to do. You write that through MMIO space. So when you want to op uh, access a context, it's been set up through the operating system, through the hypervisor. But once it's been set up, you have a TLB entry and the OS gets out of your way and you talk directly to your context doing regular loads and stores. It's very low overhead, so the latency on our chip is low, so it's very easy for us to send loads and stores uh, over to these acceleration engines. And it's very low overhead, so uh, we don't have blocking between cores because each guy has his own context, and it's also fully protected. So if I have access to context 38, I don't have to worry about the guy from context 39 coming in and stomping on my data. Um, so not only sort of debugability, but also protection across, across flows. Um, so the protection is, again, provided through a traditional TLB. And so if you have a page that maps to your context, then you're good to go. Um, if you don't have access to that, then you have to either fault it in uh, or go up through the operating system to request access. Everything's initiated without a, without a system call. So the command itself that's written into this context register, it's pretty simple. It consists of the source data, or more precisely, it's a source data pointer uh, in virtual address space, so we're not moving 
Uh, you don't have to send them the data, you just send them uh, a pointer to your, into your VA space. Similarly, the destination buffer in VA space, how big is it, how many bytes do you want to uh, operate on, what is, what is it that you want to do? So we support, um, again, it's heterogeneous, we might have multiple encryption engines, AES, whatever it is, uh, as well as compression, all sitting off of the same MICA uh, accelerator. And then also any in-band data that's needed, such as metadata for uh, encryption keys, um, that would be passed in as part of the context. All this is written into those registers, which then are fed into a scheduler. Um, the scheduler's job is to honor any quality of service guarantees, do the prioritization, uh, choose amongst the contacts, assign those to compression, decompression resources, um, and then launch that over the DMA engine in order to start up the, uh, start up the operation. The DMA engine itself, again, he's just getting a VA from the context and saying, all right, let me go get, grab this data and feed it into the engine. Um, to get that virtual address translated into a physical address, we have an IOTLB um, at all of our IO interfaces as well as in the, the MICA accelerator engines. The IOTLB um, can be faulted in, so the user can take a fault on the first use, or it can be pre-installed. Um, so this is, again, what provides you the protection. If the user's given you a bad VA, then we can take that trap in the operating system without impacting any of the other contexts. And that interrupt can be delivered uh, to any core. The uh, DMA engine itself also supports scatter gather. So we can go off, uh, our M-pipe engine supports using chained buffers. So we can spray a packet into a bunch of small buffers. Um, so a 1K packet can be broken up into a bunch of 128 byte chunks or, or whatever. Um, and then when we send that over to the accelerator, similarly, he supports that same format. So he can gather up all the fragments, put it into one, uh, one packet, and then pass that through the accelerator. And then if he wants, he can scatter that out across multiple, uh, multiple, um, multiple buffers. The API is very simple. Um, it's, an, it's, it's really just a wrapper. It's not a system call. And this is where we set up. Here's the, here's the source data, source pointer. So we just give you a nice wrapper to make it easy to do. Um, but that just results in a, a handful of MMIO loads and stores. The uh, notification of the completion is very similar to the MPipe packet engine. You can either uh, pull until your operation is complete, or you can take an interrupt. Um, and that really supports two fundamentally different modes of operation. Some, in, some, uh, in some systems, people really want the simplest model, which is just launch the operation, go to sleep, wait for it to be complete, and then go off uh, and do the next thing. But by having the acceleration decoupled from the core, we can also have higher performance systems where uh, it's either can be deeply pipelined, where you might launch one packet's worth of crypto into the system, and then you receive your, um, while, while you're waiting for that operation to complete, you can go off and work on the next thing. Um, either way, if, you're, if you want to wait for your operation to complete, you can, we have a, a very low power nap state um, that lets the core basically go to sleep and wake up in a single cycle once the operation's been completed. So finally, we think um, many core is going to require new ways to do I.O. and accelerators. Um, you know, things that worked for two, four, eight, uh, even 16 cores just don't really scale well uh, as we get up into the um, dozens and into the hundreds of cores. We think people are going to need to think about um, not only virtualization, but, you know, ways to take uh, the, the interfaces, map those into core resources, and do that efficiently. Uh, because um, anything that gets in the way of delivering those packets to the user is going to slow down the system. And finally, um, we think the off-core acceleration architecture is really the one that makes the most sense uh, in many core designs because of the scalability issues with putting uh, acceleration capabilities into each core. Our on-chip um, on but off-core acceleration for the Tile GX100 uh, part provides 40 gigabits of crypto performance uh, and 20 gigabits of compression performance. Thank you. Hi, I'm Dave Brown from the company formerly known as Sun Microsystems. <laughs> um, um, I, I was kind of curious about um, if there are any particular problems of doing cache coherence at the scale of 100 um, cores, and if there were any particular unique issues to sort of the integration. I mean, you've got two problems. One is the scale of 100 cores. Sure. The, the other is sort of maybe this more unique problem of um, integrating um, uh, heterogeneous processors into that coherence um, methodology, so. Sure, yeah, we, and we spent a lot of time on our cache coherence protocol. That's one of our, um, you know, that we, we think that's one of the major uh, stumbling blocks in going to a, a many core system is developing a, a good cache coherence protocol. 
and it's making the choices about you know whether you're going to do right through or right back and how, how we maintain the coherence across the cores. In general, we're, we're uh, it's a directory-based scheme, um, and it's a distributed. It's uh, essentially a distributed L3 cache. Uh, we think it scales very well uh, up into the dozens, hundreds, even hundreds of cores. Um, um, certainly nothing scales infinitely, but we think we actually have a fair bit of headroom uh, in the protocol to go, to go even, even higher. Uh, and then as far as the ex integrating that with the accelerators, um, it's, it really becomes a matter of putting the same cache coherence front ends into all of your IOs and all of your interfaces so that everybody's kind of speaking the same language and everybody's participating in the cache coherence protocol. Um, but once that's been established, our architecture is actually fairly easy to deal with because it's a mesh. We can, we can add new IOs at the edges. And as long as they follow the protocol, you can add in um, any number of accelerators and basically plug them into our chip. Um, and it works pretty seamlessly. Hi, I'm Bharat Mutaya with Intel Corporation. Does the Tile GX support floating point operations? It does. We have a floating point uh, accelerator. Um, I should, probably shouldn't say accelerator. We have, we have instructions in the core which aid in floating point, so it's not a direct floating point unit. Um, what we found in our previous generation was that even, uh, even things like spec have a fair bit of floating point in them. So we added some floating point, uh, even for what you'd think of as traditional integer applications, we thought we needed some floating point assist. Uh, and so it's, yeah, like I said, I wouldn't call it a full floating point unit, but we definitely have, have floating point assist. Actually, Carl, I, I have one question related to the user level uh, delivery of the interrupts. Uh, how do you bypass uh, save restore of the operating system context when you do that? Can you elaborate? Sure. Yeah, I mean, it's similar to delivering the interrupt to the operating system, but when we deliver it to the user, um, the user is in charge of his own ISR. So we have uh, essentially a system save state for each protection level. Um, so we can, we can protect the operating system, the hypervisor. We actually have four protection levels. Uh, and we can separate those things. So when the user takes his interrupt, he really just has to maintain his own state. So he has to, he set, he has to swap out any registers he's going to need in his ISR. But we do provide user-specific system save um, space in our, in our basically our on-chips or our inner core special purpose registers that he can copy out his register state, uh, take the interrupt. And so in a small number of instructions, we can actually take the interrupt process it and get back to the user program uh, much lower latency than having to go into the operating system. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Hi, one more question. Shubhu Mukherjee, Kaviam. Hey, what's, what's the die size? Uh, yeah, I, I can't really talk about, we, uh, usually I would like to talk about die size, but it's, uh, we haven't actually, this part hasn't come out yet, so I, I'm not really at liberty to talk about All right, what's things the frequency? that would affect cost. So the cores run uh, up over a gigahertz, so we have between a one and one and a half gig. In the At core. what power? Uh, the power is about five, under a heavy load, so running a pretty serious application. We're seeing about 500 milliwatts per core. So that's a heavy, and I'm giving the per core number because we, we scale okay. across, you know, and that's in our existing family, which uses the exact same core. Per core. When you say per core, do you, are you factoring the IOs or the, or the IOs are separate? The IOs are separate. They tend not to be as higher power. The IOs tend to be running at lower frequencies, so we use uh, typically higher VT devices. So they tend to not, to, they don't leak as much, uh, and they're also the dynamic power tends to be lower. So they certainly factor in, but I'd say as a percentage, the IOs um, you know, are less than 20% of the, the power typically. So if I do the math in my head, GX100 is roughly 70 to 80 watts. Yeah, that sounds about right. Thanks. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Carl, and... Uh, thank you. And Okay, uh, our next speaker is uh, Jeff Pangborn from Kavium. Uh, he's a principal engineer in the networking and communications division there. And uh, prior to joining Kavium, he served uh, in different technical roles at Cisco for nine years. And uh, Jeff has an MS degree from Santa Clara University and a, a bachelor's degree from Carnegie Mellon. Uh, Jeff. Good morning. I'm going to be discussing uh, Cavium's experience building a uh, next generation 40 gigabits virtualized security processor. Uh, this part has been branded as the Nitrox 3 and is a follow on to our currently shipping Nitrox PX part. 
I'll be covering the motivation for developing the Nitrox 3, in addition to some of the major components that are inside the chip, as well as some of the challenges, uh, design challenges we faced, and some of the lessons learned from this project. So as of January 1st of this year, NIST has been recommending that the RSA key size be incremented from 1,024 bits up to 2,048. And even though you're doubling the key size, the computation uh, difficulty is really six to eight times uh, what you experience with 1,024-bit keys. So as our customers are transitioning to the larger key size, there's definitely demand uh, to be able to satisfy the extra computational requirements. In addition, we need to be able to support uh, chips that have a larger gigabit per second bandwidth uh, for performing bulk crypto operations. In addition, also expanding the feature set to include data compression and decompression beyond just the standard uh, encryption, decomp uh, dec uh, encryption and decryption, which uh, our Nitrox family has historically supported. Uh, the Nitrox 3 part needs to be able to fit as a PCI Express adapter card, so we have a stringent limit of 25 watts for the slot power. And in addition, we've been asked to implement virtualization, hardware-supported virtualization uh, for the Nitrox 3, uh, particularly for our data center requirements. And our customers would also like to be able to have their software migration path to the Nitrox 3 be relatively simple. They don't want to have to redesign uh, the code that they've already written as they move to the next Nitrox generation. Uh, this is a simplified block diagram of what the Nitrox 3 looks like. Uh, we have a 16-lane Gen 2 PCI Express interface to the host uh, or PCI Express switch. Uh, 64 on-chip uh, crypto engines, and four engines for performing data compression and decompression, an on-chip interconnect. Uh, there's a scratch pad memory, a random number generator as well uh, that can be used by the crypto engines. And there's not necessarily a virtualization block as is shown in the block diagram, but rather as soon as the data comes into the chip, um, there's a virtualization a component that's really tagged with all the data as it goes throughout the chip, and I'll go into that a little later. Uh, this is a rough floor plan diagram of what the chip looks like. The crypto cores uh, take about 50% oh, of the total die area. Uh, the compression engines are in the upper left, and the bottom left of the die is consumed with the DMA engines, um, PCI Express interface, and uh, performing SRIOV. And between the compression engines and the uh, PCI Express controller is the instruction queue manager, uh, which is responsible for performing the VF arbitration and for distributing the work to the various uh, on-chip engines. So going into detail about the crypto cores, uh, these are Cavium Design crypto cores. Uh, they support uh, concurrently a variety of different protocols and they're microprogrammable, uh, which is how they can support a variety of protocols. In addition, if any protocols are developed in the future, uh, essentially a software upgrade allows the Nitrox 3 to support new features. And these crypto engines, even though they are definitely designed to do crypto and very, very effectively, they're really just math engines. And so you can actually be doing the module operations um, by creating instructions just for performing generic math functions that you want to offload from your processor, whether you're doing crypto or not. There's no external memory on this part. All the memory is internal, and so there's no extra cost for the customer to really have any off-chip memory or to implement any uh, interfaces for DDR3, SDRAM, anything like that. Uh, again, it's 40 gigabits per second of bulk uh, crypto, SSL, IPsec, and the RSA operations is uh, 200,000 operations uh, per second of the 1024-bit keys, 35,000 uh, operations per second for the 2048 keys. Uh, this graph is an example of how our performance actually scales linearly with the number of crypto cores we actually have on our chip. Uh, this performance is for a typical uh, frequency, operating frequency that we have on our chip. And so it's going to be uh, supporting higher frequencies if you want to be able to get uh, better performance from your crypto cores. 
Uh, we have multiple clock domains on this die. It's a new 40 nanometer process for us. And so being able to crank up the power and the clock for your crypto cores would be able to let you get better RSA performance. The compression, decompression engines, uh, we support uh, several different protocols and it's up to 20 gigabits support for compression and decompression as well as programmable scatter gather uh, DMA operations to the host. The interconnect, uh, which we have, is uh, something which really is going to be tying all these cores together with the PCI Express interface. So uh, we had a few key requirements. Uh, certainly, the way that the compression operation works is it's very intensive, high data bandwidth, a lot of data in and out of the chip to the compression engines, um, especially for bulk crypto as well, a lot of data being moved around on, on the chip. Uh, for RSA operations, uh, the frequency of data in and out is uh, less, and so that's a factor um, in terms of how this interconnect gets used. And so we really wanted to have a, a design that was, could be tailored to how we actually see data moving around this chip. Uh, the cores really operate in isolation to each other, so you don't really need the crypto cores to be talking to each other. And so supporting a, a, an interconnect where the cores had to talk to each other or perhaps uh, the decompression cores need to talk to the encryption cores, which we didn't need, uh, was really something that we wanted to take into account to simplify the design that we'd be using. So we came up uh, with some requirements. Uh, in addition, we need to be able to have uh, configurable bandwidth between the clients uh, for propagating the virtual function capability as well as uh, putting in some debug capability for ourselves. So we looked at uh, internal interconnects that Cavium had developed previously, we looked at some third-party uh, solutions, and eventually for this chip, we came up with a new um, interconnect policy. So we went with a ring topology internally. Uh, we have four ring stations that can connect the 64 encryption cores. Uh, we have another ring station for accessing the random number generator, the scratch pad memory. Uh, one ring station is dedicated for the zip engine, uh, one for the instruction queue manager, and then one for the PCI Express interface to the host for doing the DMA. Uh, so the benefits of going with the ring architecture that we realized um, early on was we were able to do distributed arbitration. So at each of the ring stations, they can be configured with really what portion uh, of, those, of that client can actually access the interconnect uh, point to point with any other ring station. In addition, uh, it was a little easier timing closure at the physical level later in the design compared to if we were trying to have a large arbitration scheme with lots of different cores trying to get their data in and out of the PCI Express interface. Uh, and then definitely, if, as we want to scale the number of engines larger, perhaps, uh, for a different uh, chip in the future, uh, this ring topology and the way that it was designed uh, would definitely allow that very easily. In addition, also avoids any kind of unnecessary point-to-point -point connections. Um, for example, we don't need our crypto engines to talk uh, with the compression engines, vice versa. And also, the, our ring would then be able to support natively any kind of virtualization information and configuration that we need to have for our chip. So virtualization. Uh, we went with PCI Express uh, SRLV, the 1.1 version of the spec. Um, definitely, we need to provide isolation and, pr and protection. We are a security processor. We don't want any virtual function to be able to access or uh, modify the resources being used by any other virtual function. So there's a quality of service uh, requirement that goes in there. So a lot of the work for doing this is performed by our instruction queue manager, uh, which takes care of the arbitration among the different virtual functions, as well as the queues uh, that belong to a virtual function and arbitrating among those and how the work gets dispatched. Uh, the interconnect is definitely a virtual function aware. And for this chip, we actually have uh, 64 virtual functions, up to 64 virtual functions. So there's a lot of thought that has to go into how you actually replicate these resources in a way where all the different virtual functions can have their own address space, copies of the registers get duplicated or shared amongst the different resources and virtual functions. 
in addition to the scratch pad memory, which is also shared by the different cores and virtual functions. Uh, this is a picture of what a kind of typical operation would look like for a crypto or a compression uh, function from software's perspective. Uh, really, the virtual machine would come and write a instruction into the instruction queue manager, uh, eventually write a doorbell register. The instruction queue manager would recognize that there is a instruction to be performed, look to see which core is available for that virtual function, assign the work to one of the cores, and then the core at that point would take on the task of performing the instruction fetch from the host memory, and then reading and writing the data, uh, taking care of the DMA transactions. And when the instruction is completed, software can either pull the virtual function registers to determine what uh, has completed. Uh, there's a count of how many completions have been, have been achieved for crypto and compression or interrupts can be generated back to the host, indicating that the work that was requested has been completed. Uh, this table is uh, really just a comparison between what the current version of the Nitrox PX is versus the new Nitrox PX. Uh, again, eight times as many cores uh, for, uh, for crypto. Uh, compression is new, virtualization is new. Uh, the crypto performance for the 10 24-bit keys uh, is now 12 times what it was uh, in the Nitrox PX. And we managed to fit into a 20 watts uh, power dissipation. So this was gonna be uh, meeting our goal of being able to fit within the 25 watt limit for PCI Express um, adapter card. So some of the challenges of designing a chip like this, um, Several new components uh, for us. Definitely uh, virtualization was a large part of that. Uh, this was Cavium's kind of first 40 nanometer uh, design. So definitely a new library. We didn't really have any existing technology in 40 nanometer to, uh, to aid us. And we came up with an entirely new verification environment, uh, which was different than something we had used for the previous generation of Nitrox products. Uh, just to deal with the large uh, configuration and operational space uh, that comes with trying to have 64 virtual functions all running in parallel and measuring the QoS that goes with those. Um, in addition, with the new virtualization requirement we had, the new verification environment, we ended up using two different verification simulators. Uh, and so there was a little bit of a challenge with that and being able to support simultaneously two simulators and what comes with that. And our intent was that we'd actually be able to use multiple simulators to really catch any kind of issues that maybe one simulator would not be able to, um, to model well with the new environment we had created. Um, in addition, some of the challenges we had is we were given a mandate. This was a, really a single pass design. We weren't expecting to do any metal spins later, any uh, you know, full air tape outs in the future, we really had to get it right the first time through. So definitely a lot of the things that allowed us to uh, get away with that were the flexibility of the crypto engines and their microprogrammable, uh, a variety of items in our interconnect are configurable from software's perspective, and definitely having a lot of uh, debug and statistics gathering would allow us to uh, really diagnose any issues or be able to tune uh, through software the performance of the part to meet the customer needs. And so some of the lessons, um, definitely uh, virtualization was something new for us. And so uh, there was a bit of a learning curve to, with that virtual functions uh, themselves and how you share multiple resources, how you how you guarantee QoS as you are resetting and sharing resources, resetting virtual functions, um, verifying that there's isolation between virtual functions over long simulation periods, and in addition also the large configuration space that comes with that as each virtual function can be tuned to operate uh, in different kind of ways. You wanna make sure that your verification uh, roadmap can actually cover that. Some RTL tricks definitely that we used uh, for faster simulation as we realized you're going through your simulation model. You don't want to necessarily keep uh, retesting some things which you've already tested in the past. And, uh, initialization procedures are really the same from virtual function to virtual function. You want to be able to really not spend simulation cycles testing things which have already been tested. 
And it turned out that actually, even though we went with multiple simulators and we did find uh, some simulators were able to catch some bugs that other simulators missed, um, it also ended up being a curse in some ways in that uh, you're dealing with multiple simulator vendors. We were reporting bugs back to the simulator vendors. And in addition, there's also concerns we had uh, with the quality of the information that you're getting from a simulator. Sometimes we're not sure if the information is necessarily a bug in our verification environment or the RTL design, or if there's perhaps issues uh, in the simulator itself. And so in some ways we felt we spent a little more debug time with the simulators themselves uh, than we would have if we were just trusting of the results uh, if we had just used one simulator. And with that, I will take your questions. Israel Cohen from UMass. Uh, I have a couple of questions. First of all, do you have a hardware-based random number generator? Secondly, did you pay any consideration to protect uh, your chip against side channel attacks, power analysis, and so on that are known to extract the secret key very easily? So I think your first question was about the random number generator, right? And so we have a, it's a FIPS compliant random number generator on chip. And what, what was your second question? I was just trying to... Sorry. About the side channel attacks, have you done, have you considered those at all as a risk? Side channel attacks from, from the host between the virtual functions? Is a, from the host or by uh, the person who has uh, in his possession your chip? His physical can... access to the chip, right, yes. Yeah. So yeah. It, is, it, is a it is a compliant component. It is going to be, it is by standard secure. We do have a model of the adapter card that we can sell that is compliant for, the random, for both accessing the random number generator and also for anyone that has physical access to the card. Uh, Bill Rash, Intel. Uh, you mentioned you had designed in some capabilities to do a single pass design, and I'm curious how successful that was. Uh, for example, are you in production on your initial design set? Our current plan is that we will be sampling this at the end of the quarter. And so we are currently evaluating at this time how well it went. And that is your initial design? Yes. Yes, okay, yes. thank you. Uh, Jeff, I, I also had a question regarding the, the code on the card. If, you're, if I read that correctly, that gets refetched for every uh, flow, or is there, what, what code is, on the card resident permanently versus what gets loaded? Sure, so the, the microcode is loaded uh, essentially when the virtual machine is booted up. The software can uh, modify the cores on the fly if they wish. They can disable certain cores and uh, reload microcode to perform, to uh, enable new functions, new crypto functions. Uh, what gets fetched is, uh, is really any kind of the metadata or the packet data that goes along with the instruction that is passed to the core that specifically says what type of uh, encryption, decryption function to perform, um, where in host memory the data resides, any specific information like that that gets fetched. And that's the production fetch. Okay, uh, I guess uh, thank you very much, Jeff. Sure. And, uh,